Good morning, everyone. We're so grateful to have you here today in the sanctuary and then also online. We are going to stand and we're going to be singing Everlasting God. going to start off um, our announcements with a birthday and it is Naomi's birthday today and so we are going to to sing This week we have, uh, we just started this last week, a uh, Bible study called Mountaintop Moments. And it's talking about uh, the times in the Bible where uh, the Lord met people uh, on the mountaintop, not always in positive circumstances, but the Lord turned it out, uh, worked it out for uh, for his glory. And it's been um, a really great study so far. So we, you can join us at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall or on Zoom. And if you'd like to join us, uh, uh, shoot us a note on the on Facebook or um, email or call uh, the office, and we can get you connected. Um, Joy has an announcement about Leal. Wanted to also invite you to Camp Leal on May 15th. That's a Saturday. They're going to be having their annual work day. We missed it last year, and we're excited to go up and do some helping around the camp. They need some help with some picnic tables, cleaning up. Um, they're doing some work on the outside of the chapel, and just a few other things around the camp, windows and screens, things to improve the camp for everybody who goes to enjoy it. Um, so that's May 15th, and the work is planning to start at around 9, but if you'd like to get there early, 8.30, I heard there's breakfast served. Um, we're going to plan to work through the day. Um, they are having lunch, and probably projects will wrap up around 3. So if you'd like to come, bring $5 for lunch, 
and um, work boots and, you know, good work clothes, gloves that you have. Um, chainsaws was also on the list. So if you've got one, bring it along. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, Pastor Paul has an announcement. We also want to uh, announce uh, that Kathy Delane passed away on Thursday, Thursday morning. And um, we're all in grief and, uh, about it. We're going to be celebrating her life uh, here Friday from 4 to 7. And people can come and go and just share with the family. And Linda tells me she thinks most of the family will be here on Friday. Is that right? Here on Friday. So we'll come and share. And then on Saturday, there'll be a memorial service at uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church in Ypsilanti. Uh, and that's at 11. And so you can also go there and celebrate her life. But uh, the family will be here about 4 o'clock. And you can come and go and talk and share. And don't miss this opportunity to come, not just to give them comfort, but to share your favorite Kathy stories with, and how much you remember and how much she impacted your life. And come and just share with them on either Friday or Saturday. And I'm told that the Manual Baptist Church, their, their, their place is about twice as big. So you can come and worship there. Don't feel guilty about coming or not coming. Uh, but please come to one time or the other and share with the family. Would you please stand? And Greg is going to share the scripture for today. It's in Isaiah. There's another verse in Isaiah that's from Isaiah 40 that kind of relates to the song, but we think this one relates to our next song. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. you that um, you have um, you have been there for us Lord and Lord you have um, just as Greg had read in this the, uh, the scripture Lord your thoughts are not what our thoughts are Lord we thank you for um, for understanding our weaknesses Lord and for being there um, we thank you Lord that you are in this service we ask uh, for your uh, blessing on the service, Lord, and that it would be, uh, that it would glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please amen. be seated. And Greg and Joy are going to share a song for us. believe 
believe I've overcome by the power of His blood. Amen. Amen. I'm alive. I'm alive because He lives. Would you please stand? Yes, we're not. <laughs> oh. Please stand. Oh. Oh, oh and actually, um, would you please stand? We're going to, at this time, um, be offering, um, taking tithes and offerings. And you can do that a few different ways. You can mail in a check. Um, you can donate through your bank or credit union, or you can also donate online. Um, we ask that you prayerfully consider at this time.
One less prayer. All right. How can we pray for one another this morning? We, of course, are praying for family of Kathy and uh, our church for our, our loss, their loss. It uh, has been a very difficult time for everybody, and we want to continue to lift up the family in prayer. And we have an opportunity to share her life here on Friday from 4 to 7, and again on Saturday at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Ypsilanti at 11 a.m. So please take advantage of those times and come and share with the family. How else may we pray for people this morning? Yes. Gloria is having a new procedure on her back. The first treatment is on Thursday. Two or three more surgeries. Mm. Try to deaden the nerves. So we're going to keep you in prayer as we go through these procedures. Okay? Prayer for Gloria. How else? We're praying for Gil. Sorry. There's Gil. Hey, Gil. Uh, fortunately, he has a hard head, but he fell in, uh, downstairs, and we're hoping for, um, you know, got stitches and everything. We're just hoping for a uh, clean bill of health and no, no complications arise from his accident and, and prayer that he wears a motorcycle helmet for doing all cleaning around here <laughs> or something. But I'm going to keep him in prayer. Yes, Bob. Bob is praising God because we prayed for his sciatic on his back and it's all gone and he's uh, feeling great and uh, we thank you for alerting us and telling us. Naomi, did you want to share a prayer? What's his, what's his, what's the husband's name? Larry. Larry has cancer of the mouth and needs prayer. Okay. Greg, we're still praying for your sister, right? Can you give us a little update? No, we're just praying for my sister. We're just continuing to pray for your sister, okay? We're continuing to pray for your sister. For those of you keeping track, when uh, Bro is at home and uh, she could use phone calls and things, she is determined uh, to uh, get, get out and keep on her own, and we want to keep her in prayer. And she says that she feels, after the procedure in the hospital, she feels really good. So we want to pray that what, what happened to her before will not happen again. So uh, just keep her in prayer about that. And she is at home, probably would love some phone calls. I talked to her a few days ago. Um, let us go to the Lord with these petitions and prayers. Lord, we are thank you that you are the God who comforts us, that you wipe away all tears, that you heal us, and you give us an opportunity to share your love with others. Lord, as we come to you. We ask for you to heal us. We ask for you to comfort us. We ask for your power in our church. We ask you to use whatever circumstances that we're in for your glory and open our eyes and hearts and minds to where you are working so that we will know what you are doing in our lives and what you are doing in the people around us. We pray all of these things and to open up our eyes and hearts to your scripture as we come to you and Look at your Bible here today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I want to make sure, I, I wanted to teach you two things this morning. I've been struggling all week. I mean, I had these things in mind. This is what I want to teach. This is what I think God wants to have us hear next. And uh, I, I was exploring this idea of what it might mean to be more salt than light. Because we're looking at salt and light this year. We want to be salt and light. We want to be positive and be encouraging. And I want to do also address some people's objection to Christianity on the basis that evil exists. So I had these two things in mind, and I've been praying and thinking about it all week. And it's it really difficult. God was saying, I want you to talk about these things. And then uh, I couldn't figure out how to way to, to walk and put these things together. So I wanted to say uh, from the onset, this morning, God has a two-pronged plan to deal with all the evil that's in the world. 
And one of those prongs includes us being salt. We are to be salt. We're to be helpful. We're we're to make life taste better and be better for people who are struggling. Jesus shared this parable in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 30. Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers. And they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds pouring oil and wine on them. And he put, the, put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to this man who fell into the robber's hands? And the man who he was talking to said, the one who showed, him, showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said, go and do the same. If God is so loving, how could he let this man get robbed and beaten on the road? Obviously, this is a parable. It's not a real man. But we know this kind of thing happens. We know that the kind of thing happens where people are robbed or killed and thrown on the side of the road and people pass them by and don't take notice of them, and don't do anything to help. We know that this happens. I mean, Jesus is sharing a parable, but this parable comes out of life. We can't argue that this stuff never happens. It's not just a story. God allowed this to happen. And when some people think about this and think about the hurt person, this brings them up short. And because of that, they think that there is no God. The short answer about why God would allow this kind of thing is sometimes it doesn't feel very satisfying for some that hear. Isaiah 55, verse 8. You find these words. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's the short answer. God created a world that has both evil and good in it. Now let me put this a different way. God created a world in which we have choice. We can choose to follow God or to reject God. That is, we can choose good or we can choose evil. Could God have created a world without evil? Yes, certainly he could have. Easy, he could have done it. When one person, but without evil, that is, without choice, none of what we do is really real. It's just programmed. We're we're just robots, automatons. God created a world in which our choices are real. When one person chooses not to follow God, it affects and influences everybody around them. When we find, and, and all of these choices then, accumulate over time. And finally, we find a hurt person by the side of the road. God didn't put them there. We did. But God allowed it. Could God have created a world where this didn't happen? Yes, but the trade-off is huge. We would have no freedom because the choices that we make are real. People get hurt because our choices have consequences. So do our neighbor's choices. God did not create evil, but he allowed it to be possible. But without God, how do we even know what evil is? God is the one who arbitrates believers what good and evil are. Without him, how do we determine that? Now, the Nazis were atheists. They put God out of the equation. They took the problem of children born with defects by putting them all to death. That is not evil, they said. This isn't evil. This is just putting forth the survival of the fitness. We're purifying the gene pool. They took the problem of racism on by killing anybody who was different from them. 
These people aren't really human, they argued. That's throwbacks of evolution. They're animals, a different species. We're making sure we have survival of the fittest, purifying the gene pool. The result of the Nazis' work is millions upon millions upon millions dead. They attempted, from their perspective, to do good in the world. The Russian communists were atheists. Under Stalin, more than 40 million people were put to death with the idea that they were doing good, not evil. The Chinese communists were atheists. They put to death anyone who disagreed with the party line, anyone with an education or an opinion that did not conform with what they said you needed to conform to. They said they were doing good. Millions killed. Even today, in countries like Miramar, Vietnam, Rwanda, people are being put to death for being different, thinking different, acting different. And I could go back in time. We could talk about the ancient Greeks. We could talk about the Romans. We could talk about the Carthaginians, the Egyptians, the Huns. They would all argue. They were not doing evil. They were doing good. And the result, millions and millions died. Without God, there are no rules that cannot be unmade. Whatever rule you have, you can change. If there's no God, if there's no objective idea of what good and evil is, you can change the definition of anything and justify anything you do as good. I can change the definition of murder by changing what the definition of a human being is. What crime is there in killing an animal? Well, crime is there in beating some of my property. The problem that we have with this kind of thinking in the church is that we do it too. We just don't do it as big. We do it in small ways. We have rules and we distort them. We distort the rules because we're sinful. We think, we justify what we think, we try to justify how we act, we try to justify how to get what we want. The parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus tells it in response to a man's question. He asks, what are the two greatest commandments? And the second of the commandments is, love your neighbor as yourself. And he asks, in order to justify his own prejudice and life, who is my neighbor? Now, when he asked who is my neighbor to Jesus, he's expecting Jesus to just answer the question. And he thought, well, maybe Jesus is going to say, Agnes on my left and Joseph on my right. Those are my neighbors, but not the people across the street. Or he thought, maybe he was thinking, oh, what well, Jesus is going to say, it's all Jews of good standing. Or, or maybe he's thinking, well, Jesus you know, has this reputation of being super compassionate. He may just say, all Jews. He's looking for a way to distort the rule, to justify the things that he wants done. Instead, Jesus tells the story. And the story is an example of how we are to be salt in the world. This is the second prong of God's plan to fix evil. What if everyone on earth acted like the Samaritan? He went out of his way to help a stranger. He made sure there was follow-up care for him. He left money uh, to, and a promise of more money. And he returned to check on him. I mean, he gave time, effort, and money. If every person on the dirt did this, if every person, every person, we would not call this place we live on earth. We would call it what? Heaven. Heaven. If everybody did it, it would be heaven. If you looked at your neighbor and understood that their first response to you was going to be love, you might treat them differently. It wouldn't matter what culture they came from or what language they spoke. It wouldn't matter the color of their skin or or anything. The world will be different. 
Or as Douglas Adam puts it, what if everybody was just nice to each other for a change? The call to love one another, to live sacrificially, to introduce people to Jesus, this changes the world. Does it eliminate evil in the world? No, it doesn't eliminate all evil in the world, but we Christians can go back and point that there has been a change in the world because we followed Christ's command to love our neighbors as ourselves. Over 2,000 years, we have made a difference. The church has made a huge difference. The church has founded the first free hospitals in the world. There were no free hospitals before we came. We founded those and orphanages. We created the idea that education should be free to all people. Why? Because every person should be able to read the Bible on their own. We created the idea of free education. We founded schools, preserved books, championed science. We feed the hungry. We have freed slaves. We champion the downtrodden. We give hope to the world. And yet this problem still persists. Ezekiel 18. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not right. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way, is my way not right? Is it not your ways that are not right? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity and dies because of it, for his iniquity which he has committed, he will die. Again, when a wicked man turns away from his wickedness, which he has committed and practices justice and righteousness, he will save his life. We understand that even if the whole world put an effort to change, we would still have a problem with evil. We would still have a problem with the man lying on the side of the road, robbed and broken. And we know the problem is not with God. The problem is with us. Jesus tells the story because the rule, love your neighbor as yourself, is the place where we begin to look for loopholes. Everyone does it somewhere. Everyone looks for a way kind of distort the circumstances and the rule and the life lessons that we've learned in order to justify things that we do. Everybody does it. Peter, Peter comes up and he says to Jesus, how many times shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? Jesus says, seven times? 70 times seven. And I'm sure Peter's response was 70 times seven. Okay, that's uh, seven times seven. I'm carrying the four somewhere. And then Jesus has to interrupt him, right? Peter. Forgive all the time, every time. Forgive a lot. Forgive more than's necessary. Forgive more than you think is reasonable. Forgive, forgive, forgive. We look for the loopholes. Peter did it. We are selfish and prideful. On our own, we cannot be the Good Samaritan. Humanity cannot function at that level of giving on its own. There will always be a breakdown in us. There will always be a breakdown as we walk by the hurt man. As some of us become robbers. In us, in us, in us. That's where the problem lies. We are too selfish, too prideful. We are sinners. If we could make the world function like that on our own, any religion would do. Any religion would fix the problem and evil would disappear. If we were able to do that. If we could do it under our own power, but we can't. We can't because it won't work, because the universe is broken, because the whole world is broken, because we are broken. The Good Samaritan is prong number two of God changing the world. But before the world began, God put another plan into action to take care of the evil that would come from our choices, even before we made those choices. The plan was to put his son on the cross so that our sins would be forgiven, so that our hearts would be cleansed, so that we would have implanted inside of us the light of the world, which changes everything. And that's not even the end of it. Now, because our choices are still in play, people can reject the gift that God offers them of salvation, of change, of taking care of the evil in their hearts. They can still reject it. 
There'll be some that will try to take advantage of God's free gift. Some who will reject it outright and distort it. Some who will flaunt it. Some who will fight against it. But there will be some who will take it. And when you take it, not only does it help you fight the evil of this world, it propels you into the next world. Amen? Because what we fight for is not here. It's going to be in the next world. And we want to bring as many people as we can into that. In God's plan, there is freedom because he gives us choice, even to choose evil. There's freedom. There is love. There is redemption. In our plans, there is death. There is death. And there is death. In God's plan, our suffering has a purpose. It's not meaningless. It's meaningful. There is love and hope, not death and despair. We can choose to reject God's plan, but miracles will happen when we accept it. When we accept him, all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I can move with confidence. I, when I follow Jesus' command to love my neighbor, I can move with confidence. I know he will work through me, even though I am a broken sinner. He will change the world because his love is so big, it changes me and then everything I touch. I know that I, when I am the salt of the world, it changes the world. And many of you know it too because you've seen it. You've seen the way you've affected people. But I cannot be salt unless I have the light. Unless he's in me, I can't change the world for the good. I can change it all right, but not for the good. But when he's in me, I can do more than I think was possible. Could we use more good Samaritans? Yes. But we can't be a good Samaritan without Jesus. As we close our service, we remember that as a church, we were called to a purpose. To spread the light, to make people see that Jesus is there. And we can do it by being the Good Samaritan. And that doesn't mean just helping a person on the side of the road who needs help. Jesus called us to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, Give shelter to the homeless, to help the widow and the orphan. And by doing those things, not only are we salt, but the light will be spread. But the point is not to keep it for yourself. The point is to pass it on, to give it to others. We would like to end our service today by singing, pass it on. Would you please stand with us as we celebrate?
trees are budding, budding, budding. The birds begin to sing. The flowers start their blooming, blooming, blooming. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you want to sing. It's fresh like spring. Now may the Lord of light give you an opportunity to share his message that the world can be changed, that lives can be saved, and that there is a place that he has prepared for us. Lord, give us that opportunity to share your news, your message. Give us that opportunity to love each other better. Give us an opportunity to be the good Samaritan to someone that we meet this week. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.